spend a little bit of time now focusing on on the Iranians themselves, getting some understanding about the Iranian people. And, uh, and Mr. Ward, your recent book, Searching for Hassan, talks about your 1998 mm -hmm. trip to uh, Iran. Can you tell mm -hmm. us what that was all about? Well, like, like both yourself, Andy, and uh, David, is it? Charles. Charles. No, the three of us spent time in Iran. And those memories were so profound that it's brought the three of us here today. Growing up as a child, I grew up under those Elbowers Mountains. I remember them with these incredible cradling arms. I mean, these are images that are etched into your, into your, uh, into your psyche. But what happened also is we were raised, fortunately, by this extraordinary man named Hassan, who was both a cook, a gardener, but he was also a storyteller. He was an extraordinary uh, guide into his culture, and he would he taught my brother, my brothers and I, many things, and really, they became part of our family. After we left Iran in 1969, the question of the family always haunted us, especially after the revolution. I think for many people here, probably you went through the same experiences. What has happened to the country? Has it totally transformed? Are these people alive, dead? What? has taken place. That always haunted us. And finally, in 1998, my mother announced that she was going back, whether her boys were going to join her or not. And she made that position. Um, she chose the date with my father, April Fool's Day, for the, for the voyage. And she decided that she was going to go underneath this politics of fear. She was convinced that she could find this family with no address, with no phone number, with no contact for over 30 years. And that began a journey that really was, was quite extraordinary, full of miraculous events. But it also opened up a window into that timeless soul of Iran, to the Iranian people that we're about to discuss. Because, in fact, when we arrived back there, and of course I had a brother who was absolutely catatonic. I mean, he was terrified. Chris was always waiting for something to happen. But in fact, once we arrived, the first thing that happened is people would stop us on the streets. Where are you from? We'd say, Amrika. Huh? Really? Do you know my brother Ali in Chicago? You know, welcome home. Some would even say, we're so sorry about what happened 20 years ago. And, and then somebody would start speaking to you in French and then Italian. And we discovered this whole younger generation, so warm, so inviting, so that hospitality, the tarof, that we had hoped was still very much alive, we discovered it very much alive. Uh, Mr. Ward, could you tell us a little bit about Hassan's background? Yeah. Um, Andy, he came from a very small town. Uh, my mother never quite remembered the name of that town, and that's why the search was so improbable. And we were able to find him only through a black and white photograph from 1963 in a country with two million Hassans. So just to give you an idea of how daunting this whole journey was, but he came from very humble origins. Like, um, like many in those days, he never had gone to school. At the age of six, his father had dragged him off to Tehran to work first as a shepherd, and then he ended up working as a gardener, and finally became a chef by the time he came to work for us. His young wife, Fatima, had never gone to school either. At the age of six, she was weaving carpets in their little village um, before he was to marry her. So that also gives you a portrait of how difficult the lives were for many of the people who ended up coming into Tehran who became part of this revolution that we are speaking of. What was so incredible is once we ended up uh, meeting that family again and reuniting, we discovered that, that all of Hassan's legends, poetry, all of this rich culture that he carried, because, because although he wasn't educated, he was still a repository for these incredible stories, that whole oratory tradition, the poetic tradition that you're so familiar with, that Iran is, is, is so blessed with. All of that was very much alive, but his children, all of a sudden we were sitting next to our equals. Mariam was a master's degree from Isfahan University. Uh, now these are the children a, a teacher, of Hassan. Yes, the, ch the children. Little Mahdi had received his master's degree in electrical engineering.
from Tehran University and was the, in charge of the entire uh, telecommunications at the largest steel plant in the, in the country. All to say that this would have been inconceivable uh, under, the, under the previous regime. Many changes did happen uh, for, for, you could say, for the underclass, but that doesn't mean that there isn't criticism. And I'll tell you, we heard, unlike what you had experienced when you grew up in Iran, and I did, of people terrified to open their mouths uh, in criticism, the jokes and the criticism is overflowing. You put a report in your book, you mentioned one you heard from a taxi driver. Well, I mean, he, 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 was, he was talking to me about a gentleman who had gotten into the cab and was complaining because he had to spend three hours on the street waiting for a taxi. And he said, well, why did you have to wait three hours? And he said, well, because I was wearing my long black robes before, but then I had to go in and change, and, and now that I've come out, you've picked me up. And the taxi driver told me, he said, if he had told me that, I would have never picked him up. Mm -mm. Also, there's this, there's this very profound, clear view that politics is a dirty business and that, and that anybody who's gotten involved in it, especially those in the, of, in the clergy, are mixing up with holding on to power, acquiring great sums of money, and all the corruption that's attached to that. And that hasn't been lost on this, young gener this younger generation. Now, What's extraordinary is this younger generation, even though we imagine this country sort of cordoned off, is cosmopolitan, it's educated, incredibly aware, and very politically astute. Now, you mentioned your, your mother was the, the kind of the driving force yes. uh, behind this trip. Um, also, in, in your book, there's a story about stopping in the, hmm. the village where hmm. uh, the... Uh, mo the family, the, mo the right. village where the president of Iran, Khatami, right. not right. Khomeini, Khatami, came from, and hearing that the president's mother still lived in the village, your mother insisted on going to visit her. Could you tell us that story, please? Much to the dismay of my nervous brother Chris, yes, she did. She announced that she was going to go and visit the mother of the president. So my mother said, listen, I want to stop. I want to go inside this, uh, this home and just speak woman to woman with, um, with the president's mother. Of course, my brother was absolutely catatonic. No, you can't. What if the secret police, what if, you know, we're going to be arrested? Our guy jumped off the bus. He said, absolutely not. I'm not going any further with you. We, we received, um, uh, we found a haji, an old man, who guided us to the gate. Very humble house no riches to speak of. My mother got down, went inside, and the rest of us, all her men, brave men, were sitting out in the car wondering, as the, tick, as the watch went by, when we would be brought in for questioning, when we would be surrounded. Nothing happened. After an hour, she came out, and my brother Chris looked at her. She was just beaming from ear to ear. And my brother Chris looked at her and said, but, but, but what, what did you do in there? What, what did you talk about? What, you, what, what happened? And she said, Chris, I talked about what mothers always talk about. I talked about family, friendship. I talked about hope for the future. And I congratulated her on having raised a, a nice son.